Uh, it is a gorgeous blue sky day today. Uh, the bluebirds were sitting on the fence. I think they're up in the uh, birch tree now. And uh, yeah, just <laughs> looks gorgeous outside. All right, so let's do questions. Now, I was tipped off by Nicola. That there are two questions that are getting at the same thing, so let's do those two together. So we've got Claire and we've got Roz asking both about anosmia. So uh, Claire's question is um, about somebody who has, um, doo -doo 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 -doo, who definitely had COVID um, and uh, presumably diagnosed, um, but has recovered, but had that symptom where you lose the sense of smell and that has not recovered yet. And so the question is, is this person still uh, infectious? And Roz's question is uh, uh, similar. Uh, so, um, you know, what if you go out and it turns out that you have uh, no sense of smell or that it's changed after uh, all the time that you've been inside? Is that enough uh, to say, wow, you know, you, you may have COVID-19 and you probably ought to get tested, something like that. I mean, in the ideal world, which hopefully we'll move <laughs> toward eventually, uh, you got to be able to get anybody tested anytime for COVID-19. Uh, right now, it's still a little tricky in some places. It is getting better most everywhere. So, yeah, improvement, we're just not there yet so much. <laughs> um, yeah, but to answer these questions, so there was a uh, very nice paper about uh, the science of what's going on here. And I don't remember if I covered it or not. Maybe I didn't, so fine, yeah. Um, at the top of your nose, uh, the brain actually reaches down and is going to make contact with a thing called the neuroepithelium. And this is just the part of your epithelium, so that's like the surface, the inner surface of your nose, where the nerve cells, that's the neuro part, uh, connect. And so you've got cells there that have, um, they're called odorant receptors. And these are the things that help you smell. They're uh, just little proteins and they're waiting for the right molecule to come by and then they'll grab onto it and kind of change shape and kick a couple of uh, things called G proteins and so on, whatever. The rest is biology. But it's going to lead to an electrical pulse coming out of that cell and the electrical pulse is gonna travel down nerve cells and uh, eventually it's gonna be registered in your brain and you're then gonna remember, oh yeah, that, that smell, that's the one that's gonna be hooked up to a pathway like, oh, that's kind of nice, or like, oh no, that's terrible. <laughs> For me, uh, um, vinegar and uh, just acetic acid in general, um, even sodium acetate, when it gets a little bit of water in there, you get enough acetic acid that it's just absolutely repellent uh, smelling. I uh, can't stand it. <laughs> um, yeah, but uh, whatever, y your mileage may vary. Um, and so the paper that came out, uh, I think last week, showed it was looking, it's another one of these single nucleus uh, library sort of papers where they pull out individual cells and then they say, okay, what can each of these cells do? So now that we know what they are, sort them into piles, what are they making? Are they making all the things that um, coronaviruses need in order to get in? And if so, let's, uh, you know, that's a possible site of coronavirus entry, yeah. And so it turns out in most of the nose, nothing. But in that neuroepithelium, there's a patch right there. And there's a really nice picture from the paper. It's just like nothing, 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 nothing. And then bright red <laughs> where it's uh, expressing loads and loads of the coronavirus receptor. So it seems like that's the part that at least should, in theory, be infectable. Now, I haven't seen a paper that actually confirms for certain that um, that little patch is the one that gets infected. but. Um, you can imagine um, as you breathe in, the virus goes in and it's gonna go right up in there and it's going to infect some cells. That's where they swab, that's why they stick that swab up in there. And so, although it's not uh, formally demonstrated yet, uh, yeah, it, uh, it looks like pretty decent circumstantial evidence to me. And so, until I see something that uh, absolutely rules it out, that's done pretty well, I, I think uh, I'm gonna probably at least uh, keep that in mind as a possible route of infection. Now, so the question is, how long does this last? Uh, and uh, is this something that, so if you have any disruption in that particular tissue at all, yeah, it's going to affect your sense of smell. And there are other things that could potentially do this besides just coronavirus. And so if you've just got that symptom by itself and you don't have any of the other ones, 
you know, uh, being on the cautious side, I, I'd still say, well, can we can we do a test anyway, pretty please? Yeah, <laughs> and uh, would hope that we get a test. Um, but uh, yeah, like you're saying, uh, or rather Roz is saying, yeah, it may be that uh, the doctors say, no, we need those tests for uh, other people who are coughing and spluttering and yeah, just seem to be in worse shape. Um, and that's probably okay. Now, as for how long this lasts, so it depends on what kind of damage we have. There are viruses like Lassa fever virus. This is one of those hemorrhagic fever viruses, kind of like Ebola, totally different kind of virus, but causes a similar disease. And um, yeah, it's a bad one. <laughs> uh, anyway, this thing causes uh, lasting nerve damage. It actually grows in some of those nerve cells and uh, in most people, the nerve cells do not ever fully recover. Uh, you can lose um, uh, hearing in one side or both sides. That's a pretty common uh, side effect. So, yeah. Yeah, but I guess at least you survive if, you know, at the end of the day. I guess that's not the worst that can happen. But, yeah, it's not good. Um, but with COVID-19, we don't even know that those cells are for certain being infected. It could be cells that are around them that are secreting something that's a sign of infection or some sort of response to infection where you end up damaging these cells in a way that leads to them not signaling as well. And um, yeah, that is just, it's, it's, a, it's a tough symptom and that alone is not enough to, uh, to cry COVID, I would say. Um, you, you would just need a little bit more there. Um, but you know, the, yeah, the, the tests work. And for people where uh, they've lost a sense of smell, this is called anosmia, yeah, if they can get tested, then boom, all of a sudden that puts you, uh, it's your peace of mind right there. Nice thing is the test is done right on that site. They put the swab right up in there on that neuroepithelium. And so if that site is infected, that is the one place where you can guarantee you will detect it. Um, all the other sites down in the uh, lungs and uh, in the throat, uh, you're gonna have a harder time. You'll have to have some of those viruses that started to come out and kind of got stuck in the nose. So, yeah. <laughs> well, there we go. I hope that was uh, somewhat helpful. Uh, it sounds like the bird was helped out a lot. Yeah. <laughs> um, have yourself a wonderful day. And uh, yeah, this is Dr. Ben.